All right, so buckle up, because today we're diving headfirst into the whirlwind that is 1920s London. Just picture it right after the First World War. A city still licking its wounds, but there's this palpable energy, a sense of urgency almost. Mm -hmm. And our source, well, it drops us right into the thick of it through the eyes of these characters who are all kind of like ships passing in the night. But as we're going to find out, their lives are all tangled up in these really subtle, unexpected ways. Yeah. And, you know, it's really striking how this text takes just a single day to paint a picture of such a complex time and place. It's like every character experiences London so differently. You can see how much their social standing, their past, even their own internal battle shape how they see the world around them. Absolutely. And speaking of seeing the world in different ways, let's talk about Clarissa Dalloway for a sec. Yeah. Here she is, this woman in her 50s, throwing a party. Sounds pretty straightforward, maybe even a little dull. Oh, but you'd be wrong to underestimate Clarissa. Right. See, she embodies this whole generation of women who are figuring out life in a society that's still recovering from the war, a society on the brink of massive change. She's caught between holding on to tradition and embracing this new freedom and that party she's throwing. It's almost like she's using it to figure out who she is, to hold on to life itself, you know? Wow, I like that, hold on to life itself. And then we have Peter Walsh. Fresh off the boat from India, and boom, he's pulled right back into Clarissa's orbit. You can practically feel the weight of their shared history, all those unspoken feelings, those roads not taken. Absolutely. And, you know, you can practically feel the weight of colonialism on him, too. Oh, definitely. He's back in this London that's both familiar and completely foreign. He spends so much time observing everyone, like he's desperately trying to figure out where he belongs, if he even belongs anymore. He's definitely got that outsider perspective, that's right. for sure. And he's not afraid to call out what he sees as the flaws of London society. Even Clarissa isn't safe. But then there's Septimus Warren Smith. Talk about a completely different experience of London. We meet Septimus, this WWI vet, and it's clear right away that he's wrestling some serious inner demons. And this is where the text goes beyond just a snapshot of London life and dives into something much deeper and darker. Septimus, well, he's grappling with what we now call PTSD. But back then, it was a wound that nobody really understood or even wanted to understand. It was stigmatized, swept under the rug. It's just heartbreaking, you know. Because here he is, surrounded by all the city's noise and chaos, but inside, he's utterly alone. He's haunted by the trauma of war. There's this one line, I think it's in the park, where even a car backfiring sends him spiraling. It sounds like an explosion to him. It really speaks to the invisible scars that war leaves behind. Trauma has this insidious way of distorting reality, making it almost impossible to connect with the world. And the tragedy is, Septimus isn't getting any of the support he so desperately needs. Instead, he's met with dismissal and judgment, pushing him further into isolation. It really makes you think about how we as a society treat those who are struggling, especially when their struggles aren't something you can see on the surface. But okay, here's the thing. Even though these characters seem worlds apart, the text keeps weaving these subtle connections between them. It's really masterful how the author does that, using these seemingly mundane moments, you know, like a car backfiring or a plane riding something in the sky, a shared look in a park, to build this complex web of connections. It really underscores this weird paradox of city life. Exactly. On the one hand, you're just a face in the crowd, invisible, lost in the masses. But on the other hand, you're constantly bumping up against other people's stories, creating these riffles you might never even know about. Right. It's like in a city as massive as London, you could feel totally anonymous, yet you're constantly brushing up against other people's lives, leaving these little marks, you know? Like, you ever think about that? Just walking past someone on the street and wondering about their story, their hopes and dreams, the things they've lost. This text really makes you do that, it makes you look beyond the surface and see this whole symphony of human experience playing out all around you. It's funny you should say that because one of the things that struck me about this text is the way the author uses that stream of consciousness technique, you know, mm. to get us inside the characters' heads. Oh, absolutely. And they're so good at it. It's like we're experiencing London not just through what the characters see, but through their memories, their fleeting thoughts, all those little whispers in their minds. Okay, but real quick, for those of us who aren't like literary scholars or whatever, what exactly is stream of consciousness? Sure. So... It's basically a way of writing that lets the reader into a character's mind directly. You follow their thoughts and feelings, but it's not always neat and tidy. It can be fragmented, kind of like our own thoughts in real life, right? So instead of the author telling us what the character is thinking, we get to experience it firsthand, like we're right there in their heads with them. 
Gotcha. So like when Clarissa is buying those flowers on Bond Street and we get that whole internal monologue, it starts with the flowers, but then it spirals into these bigger thoughts about life and death and everything. It's like those everyday moments suddenly become super profound. Exactly. And what's so clever is how the author uses these little moments, these seemingly insignificant details to dig into Clarissa's inner world. You see her anxieties, her vulnerabilities, even those moments of doubt about the choices she's made. It's like a reminder that even the most ordinary things can be full of meaning if you really look at them. It's kind of like when you're walking down the street, lost in thought, and then something just grabs your attention. A ray of sunshine, maybe, or the sound of a kid laughing. And just for a second, it shifts your whole perspective. Perfect example. It's about being present, being aware of all those little nuances of life, even in the middle of all the chaos of the city. And it's something you see with Peter Walsh, too. He's drawn to this woman on the street, a total stranger. But the way he describes her, her clothes, the way she moves, it's like he's captivated by her energy. It's like that brief encounter unlocks something in him. Suddenly, he's flooded with memories, especially of Clarissa. And that's the thing, that one fleeting connection triggers this whole flood of memories for Peter, especially about his past with Clarissa. He starts thinking about their relationship, the decisions they made, the paths they didn't take. It really highlights how powerful memory is, the way the past can bleed into the present, shaping how we see things, even how we act. It makes you wonder, you know, how many times do we walk past people and have no idea about the stories they carry? or how our lives might be connected in some small way. This text really captures that feeling of interconnectedness. We can't forget about Septimus, though. He's really struggling, and things are about to get a lot darker for him. Yeah, you're right. We can't forget about Septimus. While Clarissa is getting ready for this big party, he's sinking deeper and deeper into his own personal hell, seeing things, feeling totally alone. There's even this part where he compares himself to Keats, misunderstood and isolated. It's like he's clinging to anything that might ground him in the middle of this storm raging inside him. And the thing is, he does try to find solace. In beauty, in art, in nature, you see it, right? But it's not enough to drown out the noise. And then he marries Rezia hoping for that connection, maybe some sense of normalcy, you know. But those internal battles, they just keep tormenting him. It's like the war is a part of him now, woven into his very being. There's no escaping it. It's like he's carrying this immense weight, and he just can't find any peace. And the way he sees other people as cruel, selfish, even monstrous, like a reflection of his own internal darkness, mm -hmm. you know, that feeling of being totally cut off from everyone else. And that brings us to this really crucial moment in the text, the part where Septimus sees Dr. Holmes. Holmes represents this whole medical establishment that just doesn't know what to do with mental illness. He brushes off Septimus's pain, calls it nonsense. It's heartbreaking, really, this complete lack of understanding, of compassion for someone who's clearly in so much pain. It really is. You could feel how desperate Septimus is for help, for someone to just see him, you know. But instead of that, he gets judged. No wonder he feels so completely alone. And the saddest part is this lack of understanding. It has devastating consequences. Septimus, driven to despair, feeling totally trapped, he ends his own life. And it's such a powerful, gut-wrenching moment in the text, especially when you realize that at that very same time, Calissa is hosting her party completely unaware. It's like this stark contrast, you know, life and death, celebration and utter despair all happening at once. It really drives home just how fragile life is. It's like the author is holding up this mirror to society, forcing us to really look at how we deal with suffering, especially the kind of suffering you can't see from the outside. So as we wrap up this deep dive, what do you think is the message, the takeaway about London, about life itself? You know, I think this text, even though it just covers a single day, it captures something so essential about what it means to be human, the beauty, the pain, the fragility, the resilience. It reminds us how interconnected we all are even when we don't realize it, that our lives, no matter how different they seem, are woven together in this messy, beautiful tapestry. And those seemingly insignificant actions, they have a ripple effect. We might never know how far those ripples go. It's a really powerful message, and one that feels incredibly relevant, even today. So as you keep exploring this text, I hope you'll think about how the author takes this one day in London and uses it to explore these universal themes, you know love, loss, memory, the search for meaning in a world forever changed by war. And maybe, most importantly, how it challenges us to look beyond the surface, to see the world through someone else's eyes, to embrace the complexities and contradictions of being alive, even in those dark moments. That's the beauty of literature, right? It lets us step into someone else's shoes, walk a mile in their world.